uh, Natalie and Katie Sargent. Um, without the two of them, I mean, their their heart and soul went into putting this thing together, and I, I think they've done a great job. So uh, it's been a blast. <laughs> So, and then I'd also like to thank, I mean, all the sponsors again. I mean, we, we couldn't do this without you guys. And I, I feel so fortunate that, you know, we're sitting in such a great space. And uh, I, I always think that, you know, when we come out and we talk about these spaces, that um, it, it's extra meaningful when we get to host a presentation in a space that exemplifies the kind of issues that we're talking about. So, you know, again, kudos to DPR and to FME and, you know, all the sponsors for helping to support us. <coughs> so it's been great. Um, I think you know, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I, I think most of you guys might be aware I'm an East Coast guy, and uh, you know I get to come out here and play, uh, which is a lot of fun. But I think we think very different on the East Coast. Um, it's great to run into Steve, you know, who you know I go back about 30 years. But um, but anyway, I, I think that's rooted in the you know our pioneering days, and you know when you know people basically set out. Um, you know, not afraid to uh, you know be attacked by Indians or eaten by lions and bears, and come west, um, you know, to establish a whole new culture here. And you know, I think that the the workplace is very much like that today. Um, I think that some of the issues that we're seeing, um, you know, that are being discussed today, uh, there's there's a I'd say a much more open um, attitude to the taking the risk and pushing the envelope and trying new things that uh, isn't always apparent or as quickly as apparent on the, on the East Coast. So it's a lot of fun, I think, for us to come out here and play, um, you know, and, and talk about all these great ideas. Um, tonight, we're talking about culture and brand and, you know, how that becomes integrated in the workplace. And I think that we're coming out of a period of time where uh, Mark and I were talking earlier, you know, it wasn't that long ago where we would take uh, 10 by 15 cardboard boxes, you know, put an acoustical ceiling tile in, put a two by four light fixture in that, put some off-gassing carpet in there, <laughs> the desk, and then we put a person in there and but expect them to perform at their best. Well, fortunately, as an industry, I think we've gotten a lot smarter uh, than that today. And I think, you know, you're seeing a, a space that has far exceeded, you know, um, th those not that distant uh, standard know, that we're, we get to experience here. And, and I think this space is also one that really exemplifies the whole integration of culture and brand, you know, into the space. So I think that's, you know, part of what we kind of want to focus on tonight is really trying to get into and understand more about the, the brand, you know, and the culture. And I think those are issues that are rising above, you know, all of those traditional metrics that we used to go. I mean, how much did we hear about 200 square feet per person? Um, you know, and, and what's the real meaning of that? You know, now I think the competition for uh, talent has become so fierce, uh, especially here in this area, uh, you know, that the culture, you know, the brand, the type of space um, has to take on a much greater meaning. So I think, you know, I'd, I'd kind of like to, you know, just jump right into the discussion and talk about, you know, some of those things, um, you know, that we're talking about, um, you know, and I think, you know, the whole discussion of culture and brand I'd like to maybe ask each of you to describe a little bit about how you're seeing that, um, you know, in the work that you're doing today. So, Corey, why don't I let you? I do first. Yeah, you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, Time's up. Yep. Good. <laughs> wow. I was gonna say I'm trying to I'm trying to divert the the slides that we're gonna go through here in a second. Um, I, I think that the the struggle we actually have now is is. You know, there was a time period where creative office was something people thought of that only applied to creative companies. And uh, I think that we're, we're now having to push against people seeing what is, was considered quote unquote creative office and trying to apply to their, their brand and the relevance of the culture, not just, well, that's cool, we should do it too. Um, so, I mean, I think that, that really in all brands, how do you avoid the Me Too product? Uh, and you know, I think that the good news is they're actually talking about it, yeah. uh, where they might not have otherwise. Eric, how about you? Yeah, I think kind of uh, spinning off of that, we found that, that over the last couple of years, the, there were sort of you know standards that people said, we want a creative office, we want an office like this. It looks like this, and it has these kind of features, and it's these things. And some of that may be true, but that those those um, trends, the things that made for a creative office differed with each company. There was no one size fits all. Oh, you you have young people. 
you want an office like this. Well, that might not work. So I think it, it I think we went very quickly from, okay, a creative office, uh, one which captures this, this uh, maybe young or emerging brand, has these qualities, and then very quickly stepped away and said, you know, we can't do this by checklist. We can't kind of go through and say it's, it's this, this, and this. We have to f look for and find a different inquiry process, and I think that's the kind of thing that uh, you've spent a lot of time working on. How do you, how do you determine that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think part of the challenge is as soon as something becomes fashionable or becomes what everybody else has today, the next thing that happens is what's next and how do we actually look for the next set of breakthroughs and that, that they don't just have to be breakthroughs for breakthroughs sake but actually need to be relevant and tied back to what's happening in work and activities and the things that enable people to be productive and actually contribute value either to their business or their, their personal pursuit. And so how do we really begin to say what comes next and what's relevant in coming next and not just you know, buy the Me Too product? And I guess I think everything's changing now. And I think we will look back on this period we're in right now, you know, the last three years, the next three to five years, and we will, historians will frame this as sort of the, the the, the sunset of the command and control sort of culture, where companies prescribed the culture, pr companies prescribed the workplace, companies built all the real estate and all the cube farms, or even the glorious environments like this, and assumed that that would be the one place where work happened. Well, we're well into that not being the only place where work happens. More and more people are leaving work to get work done, some of the time, or even all of the time. So I think that the definition of workplace and of creative office is more and more being defined by the actions of the individual employees and where they choose to work. Whether it's some setting within a, a really inviting open space and elective environment like this, or whether it's some space beyond the office. So Mark, I'm curious, your business is somewhat unique. Um, you know, how do you see your clients um, you know, utilizing the variety of different types of space and you know, how does that integrate with either the brand or with their culture? The enterprises that we're working with, and, and, and my company is Liquid Space, and we've built an on-demand marketplace for workplace and meeting space. And so with the enterprises that we work with, you know, the enterprises that perhaps are clients of yours as well, the more progressive of them are thinking about mobility, and they're thinking about mobility inside their own workplace environments, and so hot desking and free address and a palette of environments like you see here. But they're also seeing that mobility extends beyond the campus. And you know, take Accenture, Dan Johnson, who a lot of us know, and you know, his mantra is growth without growth. And so they're on a, a steady path to downsize and compress their fixed portfolio, which is these environments, and increasingly put the privilege and the choice in the hands of the employees. And that means they're touching down in various places that suit the task at hand and the taste and the work style of the individual, rather than Dan trying to understand and match the workspace environment for all the employees, which is sort of an impossible challenge. Yeah. Uh, Antonio, I'm wondering, I mean, in the clients that you're seeing, um, you know, how, how do they sort of factor that whole you know, self-expression? How do, how do we identify ourselves you know, when, when they're going out and looking at new opportunities or new spaces? Sure, sure. I, I think part of the challenge is, and I'm going to you know, preempt what I, what I had prepared to say here, but. Um, part of the challenge is, especially with these younger organizations, and, and I mean, you know, younger companies, not necessarily younger people, but uh, where they don't already have their culture established and, and, you know, sort of firmly rooted at some point, you know, there's a very high level of anxiety around making decisions that result in permanent spaces that cost a lot of money, that affect everybody, and that everybody has an opinion about. So it's a very sort of anxiety-ridden decision-making process. Will we move somewhere? Will we lock into a long-term lease? Will we build and spend a lot of money and make this enormous commitment? So you have a, perhaps a group of founders or originators of, of a company who are really nervous about this next step. And so actually working with them in helping to sort of diffuse that anxiety tap into what's really important in their business and, and sort of get to the essence of what it is that they're trying to achieve and then matching that with the kind of behaviours that their people would actually need to practice in order to achieve those business goals is really sort of that first step 
in helping them take take a take a path towards creating a, an environment, whether it be a combination of environments or a single environment that actually supports their, their cultural ideals. Interesting. And then part of that, I think part of that, that that we find ourselves talking about with clients these days is that you've got uh, both the question about making a commitment towards a traditional real estate model and then the possibility of a very different approach of reducing our footprint and uh, ultimately working in a different way it comes back to trusting our employees to not be supervised into working a certain way, but saying, I'm going to hire the best and brightest people and provide them the support. So rather than supervise, we're going to support people to work in a way which is different than what I'm used to, and to trust the future of the company on that. And that becomes because talent's our biggest, and Corey and I was talking about this before, talent's the number one thing for all of us. And we have to have a lot of faith that, that we're picking the right people, we're training them properly, we're motivating them, managing them, so that that kind of a real estate strategy actually works. Yeah. Okay, Corey, um, you've got a brief presentation for us here if you want to run through. Yep. Um, did I have one? No? Okay. Uh, I think this kind of just piggybacks on the dialogue that's already started, and, and that is that when people talk about brand and culture, a lot of times people have actually separated those two things in their mind and the way they, they approach that inside their company. Um, and then on top of that, you know, when a company starts and there's two people, that's a very different dialogue than it's a few hundred people or some of these more established companies where it's a few thousand people. So the silos begin and the dialogue really starts to be fragmented. So uh, I think that our approach uh, specifically around this conversation is really trying to get at the heart of why the company matters both to the employee and to the consumer or customer whatever that that is and if that isn't the same essence then we've got to fix that gap first and try to align all of these groups so you know specifically around workplace the advantage of workplace is it typically is one of the strongest touch points where we can look at behaviors and and ritual I mean I think that's the other thing uh, that we find makes a greater impact often than even the walls that are built is what are the rituals that exist or need to exist in order to embody the type of culture and or behaviors that we want the brand to then reflect uh, because typically regardless of what we you know we can get into a whole dialogue around defining brand uh, but it starts somewhere and so we're either we're either being uh, deliberate about what the culture needs to be in order to impact the brand or we're gonna let it write it out and uh, that's just the thing about culture. It, it's happening either way. So helping clients get through to why it is and how it is uh, starts to shift it. Um, so one client example is, you know, one of the benefits we have is starting from naming a company at times all the way to every touch point, including their offices. So this is a client where we actually got to do that. And, you know, I think that it, the ethos started by, this is a, a home automation company. Uh, that also has other green energy products. Um, and, you know, the, the name actually was derived around this idea of living more intelligently. They wanted to, to remove the barriers that existed uh, and the ambiguity. So, but again, when we say brand, this is what people think about. It's these things. Um, this, is, this is identity. This isn't really the brand. Um, it's just a, a touch point or a symbol of what it stands for. As we move into the office, in a similar vein, uh, the, the, the tagline really became about simplifying life, making smarter decisions. So it's not just, again, people see this, it's like, hey, here's a lobby with a logo on it. Um, that's not brand either, and this, this won't necessarily impact culture. Um, so you know, we really started to look at the behaviors, and, and without going through a thousand slides, which I tried to limit myself, uh, I still broke the rules. <laughs> um, you know, we really had to get down to the types of behaviors that they wanted. Uh, and in their case, they had a great cultural divide between sales, uh, which kind of the, f the, the external version of their, their business, and all of the support. And they actually, I would use the word even hated each other. Uh, <laughs> and, and so to bring them into one building was a strategy that took, a, there was a lot more ritual and process in place than even the physical. But creating places where, you know, using the building which reduced a lot of expense reports uh, to actually have them eat together but then all of a sudden the culture started to shift because now they ate together uh, the one place where they breaking bread is still i think 
something that goes predates all of us for centuries, but it is something that became a very powerful point in their culture, and that's how they recruited. It was like one floor of their building and then embodying that culture and behavior all the way up. Um, but again, I think uh, this is the cafe, a portion of that. But at every turn, there was still a, a, a why. Um, there's material choices made in the way they interlock. Is there's story and meaning. So we try to make sure that we can justify every decision around a why. Um, and, you know, really, I think that extended into every product. Um, even when we launched the brand for their company, you know, helping them understand what it was all about all the way down to the, the tools that they did, trying to make them go paperless, to live and breathe what it is they talked about. Um, but other things like bringing in customers uh, so that these people who are, the, the majority of this company was college kids who did not have families or homes. So how do we embody, how do they, why do they even care when someone's calling upset about something? You know, it's like, hey, I want to make my money and get out of here. So, you know, there were customer quotes on the glass. Oh, and we're done. <laughs> it was a great time. Thanks for coming. There's refreshments out there. The bar's open all night. Um, so, you know, uh, I guess just to sum it up, here we go. Should you touch it for the rest of the time, maybe? Uh, no, it's fine. So, you know, so there were things like the customer quotes that were on the glass. So I'll back up to that really fast. You know, it was the, the glass that you could see in the background. You know, there was, it was trying to constantly remind them of what it was that they were there for and why. Um, but then, again, they had this entire internal culture. Uh, so even onboarding was something that we dissected. And this Nilly character on the left was created. Um, and really, they tried to be true to who they were and you know the onboarding process actually was a series of videos that w instead of your typical here's your 50 pages of you know life insurance and everything else uh, you know it was really uh, a more interactive thing that explained what it was that they were all about and and as I could say a thousand times uh, why the hell that should matter to them and once you get to the belief state now we can start to develop experiences that are relevant and that's where the sticky stuff gets there, right? And I think that that's the fun part, is really kind of trying to break those barriers. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of C-suite executives are dealing with so many things, it's hard to even think about, well, why does that matter? Um, and we find that where it really matters is to the end users. And if we, can't, if we don't get there, then, then we'll never get there. Uh, so we spend a lot of time trying to get to that point. So. Great. No, I'm curious. Um, Antonio, you had mentioned, um, I guess, the anxiety that some of these organizations go through. And, um, you know, I'm kind of just thinking here, what kind of things do you guys see changing the most, you know, when it comes to brand and culture, you know, within an organization? Uh, um, changing the most. I, I think the biggest step is actually the first step, that development thing, you know, who are we going to be? I think once an organization has become who, it, who it's going to be, and it, it happens by default, whether you plan for it or you be prescriptive about it or, or not, you know, once, it, once it's become something, then the changes after that are, are challenging to make significant. Little changes here and there, you get a new senior person who's very impactful in some way, uh, you, you develop a new product that makes people think differently about the organization, you have a fabulous client experience that gives you a great story to tell in a different way. These other things make smaller changes. I think the, the big change is in that sort of first cycle and that could take weeks or months or years in an organization, but that's where things are really sort of get, becoming embodied in the organization and becoming habitual and ritualized, et cetera. And I, you know, I think that's where we're really sort of focusing tonight on these younger organizations that are in this very sort of tumultuous time of trying to work out, is that kind of behavior okay here or is it not and why? Um, and how much will they design versus how much will they let happen? Well, I think Corey kind of hit on two points, um, you know, talking about space and the rituals 
you know, that occur in that space. And, you know, I'm just thinking, I mean, the space a, a lot of times is somewhat static, you know, but, um, you know, I think now we're seeing spaces, I mean, especially like this one, you know, that are becoming much more flexible. You know, so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as an organization evolves, um, you know, how, how important is the space, you know, to that? And, you know, Mark, I think maybe just from your own experience with your mm -hmm. company, because I think you've got a great brand and a great culture, um, you know, how do you see that kind of impacting you as your organization grows? Um, this might be a little bit off, off topic, but I just, what just jumped to mind was the old architecture school you know, principle of, you know, put grass in the courtyard between all the buildings and wait for people to wear in the pathways and then pave those. Right? So I think that that illustrates a notion of, I, I'll even riff on Corey's point, the brand is what is, it's, it's, it's what truly is, and what I think is changing at a meta level is that there's much more individual influence and self-expression and choice that is a part of the typical work life for a typical employee today. Very much the case in our company, and it's also what we're out proselytizing. So, so, so maybe I'm biased and pimping it, but, but I think, <laughs> but I think you know, free address is an expression of that. You know, environments like this with a palette of spaces is an expression of that. The fact that there are customer quotes that are defining the brand, rather than some echo chamber ivory tower saying this is our brand, I think is is a reflection of that. It's, it's it's organic, it's bottoms up, and then you end up with the brand. You may, you may try to set the environmental conditions to shape it, but, but you let it be. I think that that's something I didn't mention that I think is super important. There's a lot of people, when you start talking about a branded environment or brand hitting space, the first thinking is let's put logos on walls. And, yep. you know, and I think that what we're really trying to get to is what are the driving forces that even if you change the name, even if you went from selling diapers to hamburgers, which would be a great rebrand, <laughs> by the way. If anyone has those two companies, I'd love to get involved. Uh, but I have three kids. It's it's always on my mind. Uh, no, but, you know, I, I think that that is a, that's a struggle, right? Is uh, The client even often will have big brands we're working with drop a deck and say, don't use this and do this. And you're like, that has nothing to do with your brand or culture. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it really trying to drive to, again, like, even the stuff we put on, like if there's something going on a wall, what is what is the thing that's innate inside of them that's that, that won't change? Because uh, like you said, the flexibility is the one thing we can guarantee is that's going to increase. So we can't we can't be stuck by saying, well, we painted that wall orange because our color is orange, and, and that's I think important too. The branding spaces. So Eric, maybe I'll ask you this question. I mean, what are what are the things that an organization could spend money on to build and reinforce? that brand and culture, you know, even from a space perspective. Just well, your time, right? Well, you're going to pay us first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, good part consultant. Of it, no, part of it is, is, I think, having a real clear understanding of what it is we're trying to do. I mean, we can spend a lot of money creating a physical plan uh, that's based on some set of um, uh, beliefs by a C-suite or somebody else. Spend loads and loads of money doing something like that, and find it's completely off base. And for f people to work in more flexible physical environments, more flexible yeah. kind of cultural environments, uh, or one which is shifting, it doesn't make any sense. So you know, we're all working towards things which are more flexible and, and allow for different ways of working. But I think in terms of, and you know, kidding aside, your 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 best investment is getting a better understanding of what it is. The, the company is about because there is no one size fits all. We have different workforces. We're after uh, different objectives with with, with you know, our clients' business, and we have to understand that before we go out and just say, "Oh, you're a technology company. You should look like this. You should put that. What's your color? Yeah, we'll put that on the wall. And yeah. everybody's gonna wear shirts that look like this. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, t-shirts. Yeah, brand color on a wall. Yep, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Open ceiling. Yeah, yeah open ceiling. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it's really about building that vision and uh, creating alignment around that vision. I think it's understanding it. I think it's really understanding it. And I, I think, uh, you know, we've talked, uh, everybody's touched on some form of it. You can't force fit that. You can't, in a very, except for a really, you know, uh, a charismatic leader who just said, this is how it's going to be. And we see some of that. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, that's not going to go very far. I think there's a new dimension as well that companies have to manage to, which is time. Because the rate of change of companies, whether it's growth rate, 
in hiring rate or, or, or falling from grace rate, it's massively compressed compared to the rate that companies used to grow and the durability of companies. We start projects and by the time they're done, the company's completely changed. Yeah. It literally has. Yeah. So you Six just can't months, take months later. Yeah. They've, they've doubled in size, they've halved in size, they've yeah. gone off in another direction. To Corey's point, you, know, you start out with an engineering idea and you've got, you know, three, six, ten people working on an engineering idea, then customer service comes in. Oh, that's a different, that's a whole different thing. Oh, we have salespeople now too, and the customer service people. The company changes completely. How do you track that? And by the way, we just got acquired three times in the last year. <laughs> I mean, that's, that is that is the interesting the world that we live yeah. in, is, is mm -hmm. that, you know, in this area specifically, it's not just an IPO of that individual company. In a lot of, t a lot of cases, there, you know, there's a volatile nature of we just got bought by a major brand and how are we, what does that even mean? Will we hold on to? Because they'll we say we're going to leave you alone and that, like, that lasts four months, yeah. Yeah. guaranteed. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, so I, I mean, and you're usually still like halfway through the process yeah. and a we're project. Not we're not done with the permit drawing yeah. and you're submitting and you've got a contractor queued up to do a million dollars, three million dollars worth of work and that whole department's gone now. What I do you do? I interviewed an engineering executive today who, I mean, we're talking about his resume and, you know, his first entry was uh, joint company, hired team of 30, built product, acquired by Oracle 18 months later. Like, you, I mean, now square that against the build cycle of this project, right? You know, he, he, his company got to the size where they would have needed this capacity, but he was already exited to a company, you know, to Oracle by the time this thing would have been starting to put shovels in the dirt. So. Again, that time cycle is, is in some cases, not all, yeah. but in some cases, uh, very dynamic. Well, you, you kind of raise an interesting question, and uh, this might be a VC question, but you know, we're, we're talking about brand and culture, which in many ways is an intangible concept, um, but it has value. And I'm wondering if there's a way to calculate, you know, um, you know, how, how do you measure that value? Is there is there a way to calculate that? Or, Let's. You know, Let's go next. I got a couple of visuals and then we can yeah. talk a little bit about that. How do you operate this thing? Just push the right hand. Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> right and left. No, sir. We've been talking about branding and I thought it would be uh, from kind of my, my old school experience on the, on the advertising agency side, important to kind of understand where brands come from. Um, before this, before what, what we know from the 60s, 70s, 80s in branding, Branding was branding a cattle. And as you were coming across, you were talking about the pioneering nature of the West Coast. Um, as we were coming across the, the country, we were trying to identify our property, which was our cattle, and we branded them to make sure that somebody didn't steal them. And so, so the first part of branding is identity. It's, it, it's identity associated with that belongs to me. So it's ownership. Then it's identity. Is that the Barquet Ranch? We better not mess with them versus, I don't understand, we can steal that cattle. So it goes from ownership to identity, and then identity quickly into meaning. And when you start to think about a brand as, as having meaning, that's the part that gets, gets a, little, a, little, uh, a little squishy. So you look at Coca-Cola and the joke for, you know, for decades, it's been, well, it's, so, it's, it's just sugar water. Well, no, it's, you know, grab a coconut, have a coconut smile, you know, or whatever it is. So the branding, that branding culture, even before that, uh, Kleenex brand facial tissues became Kleenex. So the proprietary brand became the generic. Yeah. That was terrific. Frigidaire became fridge, put it in the fridge. Generic terms that are adopted from a brand. So as we sort of, and, and from my perspective, when you talk about branding a space, Corey's exactly right. Oh, your color's green and the logo looks like this. Okay, we got T-shirts and hats. The logo's going to go on the wall. Let's use let's use a little bit of the green in the carpet. We're good. We're branded. Well, that maybe misses the point. Um, in DPR, and, we've, and thanks to everybody, first of all, for for um, recognizing DPR and for DPR hosting us here and giving us the opportunity to work with these guys. Uh, these are a couple of shots of other DPR offices and um, our secret weapon in. Winning the DPR project was Jen Harding. Where's Jen Harding? Raise your hand. There she is. Um, who did work for DPR in uh, Arizona and the Carolinas. We largely got the DPR project as a firm because, not because Jennifer had just worked with DPR before, but that she understood the culture. She mm -hmm. understood the brand. So here's a company which is not a startup, 
Uh, who's from, where, where's my, Craig, how long has DPR been around? 24 years. 25 years. Okay, so not a new, this is not a startup. Uh, this is, and, and, and it's, it's a national company, very successful contractor who differentiates what they do in an interesting way. Uh, <coughs> DPR exists to build great things. And the two, what are, what are the two points? Uh, the uh, importance of the individual and um, help me with the second one. Change Rocky? Change the world. 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 We can change. And you know what? That's, you know, we, we can laugh at that, but, but I'll tell you, if you start to work with the people at DPR, you believe them. So people will say, well, you know, what is it about DPR that's different? It's working with the people. It is not the DPR logo on the lobby wall. It's not the T-shirts. It's not the logo on the letterhead. It's it's the people. It's how they do business. It's how they treat each other. It's how they interact. So this space uh, is, is designed specifically to try to support that. So it's not branded in terms of the logo, the color, or things that we might take from the prior slide as being identity. It's about now the brand becoming a culture. So as we kind of track um, what's important in that for all of us is we're operating a little bit out of our sweet spot. We're designers and architects. We're now doing some level of sociology or some level of therapy in the process of working with a lot of our clients. In the case of DPR, we were very fortunate. Jen's our secret weapon. She's worked with these guys before. She gets, it, it's the, I get you. You guys understand us. That is the secret. And it's back to what do you spend the most money? Where can you make the biggest investment, the, the most uh, impactful investment? It's understanding our client. We had a leg up. And the project, I think, as a result is, is evidence of that. For us, kind of the other end of the spectrum is a project we did for an accelerator. Uh, and this is something that, that, uh, that Mark knows about. This is uh, Runway, which is an accelerator in the Twitter building. And in this case, Going to the under, other end of the spectrum, this is a place where you can rent three chairs or 10 chairs and you can take your company from your dining room table or uh, a table at Starbucks and have a place to go three or four or five days a week. And this is, this is running in parallel to Mark's business, but here's a place where you can go with a couple of people you're working with and start to get your legs underneath you as a company to try to understand who are we, what are we about, what is, the, what is the brand about? And in this case, Runway is not a branded space. It's a very neutral backdrop. So people come in here with two or three of their closest friends, put up a, a, a foam core character that says, this is who we are with their logo on it. And that's their first start in the direction of emerging as a company. And then they call one of us and say, hey, we need, we've got 20 people now. I got a customer service department and a sales group, but we have 50 people. What do we do? And that's where we inherit that sort of next piece of things. So I just wanted to kind of frame the idea of branding in terms of what it is we do. And I have to tell you, <coughs> coming from um, a traditional advertising and branding environment in the 80s, this is a real different world that we're living in. Brand, brand is, is not just ownership or identity or differentiation. It has to do with understanding the culture and supporting how we work. And it's not um, a supervisory environment. It's a supportive environment that's real squishy and kind of hard to manage. And I think leading to, to Antonia, that's the kind of thing that's difficult for a lot of us as traditional designers who have a certain uh, background to try to understand. So I'm going to turn it over. Um, you know, I'm just wondering, I mean, you know, the, uh, the relationship between space, um, you know, and that brand and culture, um, I guess, is largely symbolic. But um, I'm thinking that the, um, the space or that environment uh, really in some ways kind of frames the context for a lot of those behaviors and a lot of those rituals you know, that take place. Yeah. So. Yep. In the case of DPR, it's a, it's, a, it's a complex environment. These guys are working on very sophisticated projects. They've got really knowledgeable, capable teams, high level of collaboration. We talk about collaboration all the time, and I think a lot of cases don't know what we're talking about. These guys really work very closely together. Our first project meeting with them was unlike any kickoff meeting I'd ever been in. These guys are really connecting in a way which is, which is I think, vital to the success of their business. And it is different. It's a, it's a very different experience. You know, I'm wondering, the other aspect that I think is important, too, um, is the, 
communication to build that community and those shared values. And I'm wondering, you know, Corey, you might speak to this. Um, you know, what are some of those mechanisms that an organization can use to communicate you know, those values? Oh, that one's difficult because I do think it's in bed in the beginning. And again, even we, there are certain cultures that are email heavy and that works, mm -hmm. right? And there's other cultures where that's never going to work. Uh, you know, and certain groups will do all hands weekly and certain that scale is just not available. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 I'm going to give you a squishy answer back, right? Is a, a lot of this... I think that some of the most important communication happens at the transaction of a, a new employee coming in. Um, you know, do they, if it is changing the world, if anyone comes in and doesn't believe they can change the world, they should hop out, right? <laughs> uh, and it should be the same way with the customer. You know, and I think that's why people often use Apple as an example. People are willing to pay more, even at inconvenience. Not that Apple Maps sucked any more than anything ever, but it did. And you deal with it, you know, so because it's Apple, right? And there are other people who would never purchase it, right? They don't see the value. That should be the way you, it starts. Uh, and I think from there, then you can start to build the communication tools that fit that individual culture. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, personally, I feel like every company you work with, that's vastly different. Yeah. So. No, I'm just thinking, Mark, you mentioned Dan Johnson and uh, you know, the, the Accenture model, which is sort of the growth with no growth. Um, you know, and, and there's an organization which really kind of disperses, you know, their people. They arm them with great technology and push them out, you know, to some degree. Um, very efficient in terms of their space, um, you know, as opposed to, you know, a Google or an Apple, which is going to say, hey, you know, you need to be in the space, you know, in order to innovate, you have to be present. And, you know, so I'm wondering, I mean, from your perspective, you know, you're probably seeing a lot of those companies that are almost the road warrior, you know, kind of culture, you know, in terms of uh, you know, their yeah. growth? It's, it's, it's logical to think so, but the reality is even the most conservative 100-year-old consumer product brand companies have meaningful percentages of their workforces that are spending significant time working beyond the campus. So um, mobility is a reality either for fully mobile by business model companies like Deloitte and Accenture, but also for Procter & Gamble and Autodesk and others where yeah, they have vibrant, important campuses, and pe they do want people there to collaborate when collaboration is needed, but they also are, are open-minded and porous with regards to their impression of what the workplace is. And when employees need to be abroad or on the go, they let them do that, and they actually look to equip them to do that more effectively rather than trying to pull the Marissa Meyer, which I'd say is the sort of one of the last gasps of command and control as a yeah. mentality. Right? So, you, you must come here to work. Can I just add a counterpoint to that? Um, for all of those organizations that have focused and succeeded in achieving or allowing their people to achieve great mobility, there are a lot of conversations happening now about presence and how, how you actually be still present with your team even though you can be mobile and, and dis dispersed. And so, you know, I would predict that that's one of the very strong things that we're going to see in the next evolution of the workplace, where all of those abilities technologically enabled to bring people back together and have them feel really part of a, an integral team um, will be you know, where, where we're fo focused. And then as creators of environments, physical environments, in a, where these technological tools are available, our challenge is going to be how to integrate those technological representations of the presence of people into walls and ceilings and floors. And so I think, you know, that's where we're going to have our next evolution and tension in the, in the design of physical work environments is, is how to have a hologram of, of Mark in the room when he's not with us and how to make that acoustic performance of that space such that we, we can distinguish when he's speaking softly and when he's projecting, you know, emphatically on something. So I think that's our next big task in our, in our future. So do you think it's fe re, um, feasible to um, think that uh, we could all be in various parts of the world and having a discussion like this? Yes. Yes. 
Well, yeah. we, I mean, our company is in five time zones on three continents. And we do, and we're an agile development company, which means we ship code every week, and, and yeah. we're pushing stuff to production servers every day. And we do an all hands uh, agile scrum meeting every Tuesday morning. And it's Minsk and Minneapolis and Sydney and San Francisco. And we're looking at each other. I mean, and we're using free, off-the-shelf, web-based collaboration software, so not, not paying for telepresence. And, it's, and, 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 uh, and we also appreciate that proximity is important and valuable. So we have an office in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can both hire for talent wherever it may live, and when it's important, co-locate, mm -hmm. but also embrace dispersion when it, when it serves the needs of the company. So I think technology is pretty amazing in terms of bridging that hologram gap. It's happening. Yeah. Great. Um, Antonio, do you want to pour us Sure, sure. I wanted to, to take us um, a little further than uh, thinking uh, necessarily about you know, what our clients or, or what users of space are doing but actually think a little bit about what skill sets we bring to the challenge of helping them diagnose who they are and, and think about who they are uh, as an organisation with a culture and a brand and how they want to express that in the physical environment. So I'm going to talk about tools for just a couple of, a couple of minutes. And um, sort of I, I mentioned this idea about you know, the anxiety of the, of the young organisation you know, making its early major decisions. And you know, I have found the value of the balanced scorecard to be extremely high in um, having a successful engagement with leaders of an organisation at that stage in their evolution. And so, um, you know, this framework enables us to talk to the leaders of that organisation about each one of these aspects of their business distinctly with um, a clever and sensible set of questions around each of these ideas, really delving into what it is that's on their minds about who they are as an organisation, what they produce, what their business processes are, um, who their customers are, how they engage with them, and who their people are, and who they want to attract, who they have today, if they want to make a shift in that or continue, um, and actually get to the heart of what's in the founders' heads most of the time. Frankly, they're not mostly thinking about the carpet or the wall material or the arrangement of spaces. They're mostly thinking about how they're going to succeed in their business going forward, whether it be 18 months from now and getting acquired by Oracle or just you know, for the next hire. So you know, the balanced scorecard gives us a really good framework for engaging and sort of helping founders and, and, and early uh, leaders in an organisation define their vision for what's, what's going on. Um, in a couple of conversations using this method, I've, I've got to the point where I've said to them, some of these folks, I've said things like, have you really got this in the bottom drawer or in the, in the, fi in the uh, network file somewhere and you're just holding out on me and you're not actually revealing this bit of information? How come when I'm digging with you about business process, etc., you're not just showing me how it works? And you know, each time I've asked those kinds of questions, I've got back, we've never thought about it like this before. So we know that these people are thinking about these things because they're developing their business on a day-by-day -day basis. But to think about it in sort of a holistic fashion with these four quadrants in play and how these things interrelate to each other is sort of new in the, idea, in the minds of many of, of uh, the founders of, of young organisations. So it's an interesting method to, to use to engage with them. You can do this over a short period of time, a couple of short meetings. You can, one-on-one, -on -one. you can do it in a big group over a longer period of time. There's, it's very pliable philosophy around getting at what's happening in the business. So once we've heard what they've said about themselves, that's one thing. We can all say something about what we think we are, you know. Um, but in reality, uh, you often observe something else. And so the second part of the toolkit is to really start looking around for what people are doing. And, and um, I have an, an interesting story. One of uh, this, this uh, image on the left was, is from one of my clients right now. And I remember coming into the front reception, sort of walking through a portal. It used to have a door in it and they'd taken the door off and they're all open and cool now. 
and a small company, you know, with, with 100 people all beavering behind that open doorway. And uh, went in and sort of met with the, with the guys who'd started the company uh, 18 months, two years or so ago, and they were explaining, you know, and answering all these balanced scorecard kind of questions. And um, on the way out, I walked back, of course, through that portal out into the reception to, to get out of there. And this image on the left-hand side, this poster, caught my eye. You know, nobody in that conversation that we'd just had about who they were mentioned this thing, that they had a poster about their core values, that they'd even written it or thought about it. Because they paid a consultant $30,000 to do it for Maybe, <laughs> maybe. And so, you know, I, I took a photograph of this and, uh, and promptly went on my way and, and continued to observe these folks and watch how people were behaving and, and, and pick up a whole lot of um, sort of observational data by hanging out in their space with them and chatting with people when they went to the kitchen to have a coffee, etc. And, you know, just looking at things like how busy is the kitchen? Is it filthy? Is it neat? Is it, does it look like it's ever been used? Are people standing up and talking to each other or are they sitting down pouring over, you know, minute documents or, or you know, screens, etc. You learn so much about what you see people doing. So I took what I saw, I took the core values poster and what they told me in our balanced scorecard vision discussions and began to create this lace work and say, you know, these are the things that, that seems to be what you're really about. And, and how does it tie back to what you're saying are your core values? And, and they were stunned when you know, I showed up with this incredibly basic slide that they began to actually see the webbing between these separate sort of pillars of thought that they'd been through themselves. You know, what is our business? What are our core values? You know, how much IKEA furniture do we need? And actually start to tie all those things together. So, you know, interesting tools. You certainly use your ears and listen and ask good questions and then, and then look and watch really carefully at what's going on in the space. So pulling those two things together, then we get the opportunity to sort of define a program or uh, for, for what the physical environment um, might be like and to begin to develop some recommendations that will support the kind of behaviours that are either desirable or, or uh, are prevalent in, in, their, in their space today. And you know, if, the, if the client doesn't talk about growth and flexibility themselves, it's really incumbent upon us to bring up those questions. And uh, you know, we get to the, the point in time in these engagements where we always say, who's got a better crystal ball? Is your crystal ball bigger or better or clearer than yours? You know, nobody has. Nobody's crystal ball is any better. Um, but what we can't, and so they're very um, infrequently able to define what they will change into. You know, could that guy say, I will be bought by Oracle? No, he couldn't, but he might have some sense for, and I always probe around questions of timing and duration of change. You know, how, how frequently, how quickly do you think a variety of possibilities might happen? And that helps us give a little horizon on how fast the CDs have to be done, right? Or, or something else, you know. How durable does this environment need to be? If they believe that some dramatic change is a year away, it makes you think a little less permanent about what you might be creating in the here and now. And so, you know, that the timing of change is as important a question. And then, you know, we always then bump up against this issue of desirable flexibility can be very expensive, relocatable walls, things with wheels, you know, various transformable stuff bumps up against budgets and they're not really very flexible in many cases and so you know we then come back and say what is it about the technology and the people that is way more flexible than the staff and then we get into a different type of conversation engaging in change management and things. So just a couple of points there about the kind of tools and the kind of engagements that you might have with your clients to help sort of get to the essence of who, who they think they are what it is that they're actually doing, and then how they might plan for that going forward. That's great. Actually, uh, why don't you give it to Mark? I think in the interest of time, we'll turn it to Mark, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. Um, so we walk into this, or I walk into this topic, um, maybe a little bit more focused on workplace, given, I think, the 
implications that it has on brand and the implications that people think it has on brand. And I think Corey did a great job of broadening our perspective that it's much more than just workplace, but, but I'll qualify what I'm sharing as the workplace component on brand. Um, and, and we walk in with a notion of, of really empowerment for an individual, but before I come back to this notion, let me just jump to here. So the question was, who owns brand culture? And in the context of the built environment and workplace, I'd say historically, it's usually some troika kind of like this. You know, facilities management is going to deliver on an experience, and they're going to draw on able-bodied uh, experts, architects, workplace consultants, and the like to help them bring some personalization to it. Um, they're also, of course, going to have at their side somebody with a budget, economic interest. And so the factors that I typically see this top-down and classic approach being heavily influenced by are things like what's our employee churn rate going to be, or what do we think our forecast is, what's our stock price, how much latitude do we feel with our dollars, uh, what's our forecast for 10 years, uh, what are the current lease comps in the market, do we feel like we can go big and go long, or do we have to be more short term, what actual budget do we have on a dollars per foot or dollars per employee basis, um, how does the rest of our portfolio look, should we be feeling good about that, or are we way bloated and oversized by millions of square feet, and what's the coolest thing that I saw at Neocon when I was there last June, right? So that oftentimes also is a you know, squirrel. So, um, so qualifying or, or exception, uh, while this DPR space is extraordinary, net zero, clearly uh, an empowering environment for individuals, this is still unfortunately the exception. And all too often, that approach you know, brought us this, right? It brought us the 10 by 15 box or the relatively expensive 10 by 15 systems solution from you name it. They all live in you know, Western Michigan and they make great product. Uh, but, but it brought us this, right? It, it brought us a top down prescribed environment where, where the individual and individuality wasn't really factored in, but rather it was 200 square feet or 12,000 square feet, $12,000 per person per year. It was some quant that was normalized against the entire employee base. And, you know, He's not smiling, right? He's, he's, not, he's not doing his best work. And, and while this is a bit glib, this notion of being chained to the desk, that really was the expectation, right? You'll come to this location to do your work. So um, we're in a different era, I suggested earlier, where everything's changing. And I think the big meta trend underway is really a consumerization of companies, a consumerization of the workplace, a consumerization of the enterprise. And so examples? Well. Uh, there are marketplace businesses now that are on my phone that are changing or offering up an alternative approach to almost everything I do in the course of a work day. So let's imagine I'm a salesperson at some large company. Let me pick one. Um, and I uh, need to get some graphic work done for a presentation for a client before I fly off to visit them next week. I'm just as likely now to go to Odesk, an online marketplace, to hire some graphic artist in India or Phoenix or Bangladesh to do that work for dollars uh, and do it in a day rather than sending the request to my marketing department because I know it might take three weeks. Um, when it's time to go to the airport, I'll go to a, yet another marketplace and instead of calling the travel department to arrange my, my to and fro, I'll simply tap a button on my phone and the car magically appears in two to four minutes. Delightful, right? Self-elective, right? I do it myself. Um, when I get to that locale to do the meeting with my client rather than doing it in Starbucks unproductively, I'm going to reach to a marketplace and find a great space that matches that task, where I need it, when I need it, on demand. Uh, if I really want to impress that client, I might reach to yet another marketplace and have it catered. I'm not going to call my travel department to do that catering. I'm going to tap Postmates or any of the other marketplaces that deliver a service on demand at my election. Oh, by the way, all these things I'm not asking for permission. I'm just doing it. I'm just doing it. And I put it on my expense bill, if, if at all. And lastly, at the end of my trip, I'm just as likely today as a business traveler to go to Airbnb to spend the night. Business travelers are their fastest growing segment, rather than going to the prescribed company-ordained top-down approach. So this is epidemic. And, and what's happening with each of these categories is that departments inside the company that used to be a part of the brand, that used to dictate the experience of an employee, are being supplanted by simple, easy, delightful, personal experiences from companies like those. So back to the question, who owns culture? Well, I, I'd suggest to a much larger degree, culture is coming from me. It's coming from the employee. I am the culture. I am the brand. And 
And I'm not just an employee, but I'm also an architect. I'm also a CFO, but I'm an architect or a designer because I'm gonna choose the environment that best suits my style and my taste in the moment. And I'm also a CFO because I'm gonna be conscious of the expense. And I might choose this $50 an hour space for my touchdown work versus this $200 an hour space. I'm gonna be responsible. I'm empowered, you can trust me, I'm a good employee. So is this the end of architecture as a craft? No, absolutely not but a large portion of empowerment and decision-making is flipping to the individual. So as it relates to workplace and the, you know, the, the collectively, I'm not at all suggesting that uh, the campus or the office is dead or should be dead. It's still incredibly important. It's incredibly important as an expression of brand. But brand also now is gonna be the result of those individual choices that employees are making on a day in and day out basis the client meeting or the product launch they do in a boat in Miami, or the touchdown work that they do in a Marriott in Dallas, or the sales team meeting that they do in a co-working space in, in, in New York City. These are all personal expressions of the work style of the individual employee, and all of that rolls up together in this big messy soup and becomes the brand of the company overall. And oh, by the way, as an aside, this behavior also brings flexibility and economic leverage i.e. Total, lower total cost of ownership than legacy models did. So you know, companies like Accenture that are embracing growth without growth, they're doing that because they're saving money and they're seeing human performance increase. So, so there's two sides of this. What is brand? It's gonna be the outcome of all these individual choices plus the top down stuff, but there's an economic win as well. Thanks. Well, these become, I love Corey's comment on ritual. The, I mean, yeah. this becomes a ritual, too. Yeah. Right. Um, Which has to be, I mean, the challenge has to be, it has to be enabled, right? Right. Because right. I, I agree that all of this is available, and that's where, I, th I definitely think that's where the shift is going to come. Because I even say now, I mean, a lot of open workplace does not, a, does not really flex. Like, a lot of these, especially the big companies, are still buying a benching system so you're yeah. in an office or in a benching system, and maybe it raises, but from an economic standpoint, a flex standpoint, the customization of light and dark, you know, noisy and not, I mean, we're still kind of saying, this is the type of work environment we're working in. We are, you, we, 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 in some companies uh, that haven't really looked at the big picture, they're going from everyone has an assigned desk or everyone has an assigned cube to now everyone has an assigned bench area. Exactly. And it's equally <laughs> prescriptive and yeah. it's no less personal yeah. and it's no less effective in terms of productivity, which is the real total cost for a company. Yeah, and I think so. that that's, uh, you know, just to close on, on that point, I think that, yes, the, the, we're unlocking the ability for personal interest uh, but that's where, if the belief and the values and the, and the why isn't in place, that will get out of control, yeah. right? So if that's where it's still, it, I think at the end of the day, you, we still have to create culture and brand that's principle-driven. Mm -hmm. Not prescribed, yeah. but principle-driven so that, you, like you said, I'm now the CFO, I can make the right choice. Where before I feel like it, the rigidity is actually, it's compounding the problems. Right? But if you don't have the right people, you're, yeah. you're out of luck. Yeah. This, does, this doesn't, if somebody's yeah. gonna, uh, yeah. And, yeah. and that, yeah. that is, uh, it's back to, do I, have a, you know, do I have an approach which says I'm gonna supervise people, mm -hmm. or I'm gonna support them, and do I have a staff in turn that is capable of performing well um, in, a, in a support, by being supported instead of somebody telling them what to do. That's a whole other bigger business model question that some of us, you know, it's beyond some of us. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you know, we're pretty much out of time, but I'd love to open it up for questions and answers if anybody has any. I think we've got some great concepts that were thrown out here. Um, this is more just like feedback as a comment. Um, you've all um, uh, had this enormously great information to pass it on. It, it strikes me that because technology is changing on a daily basis, how we work and how we show up. And part of our thing is checking in with people to see how they, through use of being enabled with technology, how to work. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the challenges of that is how to how to supervise and manage them and create environments that will support that. That's that's a real big issue. The other thing going back to brand was really if you're familiar with the work of Simon Sinek. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? Right. Is is you know really why the company even exists. So it's it's important to kind of continue to check in and when you hire people, you hire them with, you know, this is why we do what we do. This is why we're passionate. You bring these people and they have to kind of be singing that song, they have to be part of that. Mm -hmm. But you have to support them. The management of them and creating environments to support that, to me, and just kind of summing up what I'm hearing here, would be the real issue is to create an environment and, and, and a culture that can be flexible to be able to work with them. Am I right on that? Or Bob, can I respond on half that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Only half, though. Half, not leave the other half. <laughs> the, um, this uh, this um, impossible challenge that facilities managers, real estate executives, designers have had is that they're supposed to understand how people are going to work in advance, which, which is why we end up with these prescriptive experiences. The opportunity that comes with giving employees choice and the opportunity that comes with there being a palette of spaces that they can choose and, and book or, or tap into is that now with the technologies that people use to do that, if I start booking workspaces, whether inside my company or outside, I can collect that data exhaust. Right? I can see where Bob chose to work on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? And I can then build my environments or extend my environments to reflect how people are actually working. It goes back to the pave the, por pave the, pave the quad where the paths get worn. And so, you know, one of the ways that our corporate clients are using liquid space is they're saying, here, 500 salespeople at Autodesk, here's liquid space, go forth and work. But then they look at the patterns. They see the types of spaces that get used and not used. And that's an opportunity for that data to, to become a part of the brand that they reinforce internally where they build their own buildings. So that's one opportunity of technology is to actually look at data over time and, and build more of that. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That's yeah. a really critical thing. Because even if technology may or may not be in your work, you can actually tell how many, you, you can sense how many people are in the space. You can even sense what they're being created. And a lot of those technologies are passive, whether it's an IR counter or a sensor in a chair. Yeah. What if there was a way to know what actual workspace everyone chose and who actually came? What if you were able to have that data down to, so rather than four warm bodies in the room, what if I could know it was Mark and Antonia and Corey and Bob? And that they actually, it was two people from sales and two people from marketing who used to hate each other, but they came together for a meeting. That level of data can be available now, which is sort of a, a, new, a new quantum leap in terms of insight. And it keeps changing. Yep. Well, imagine if you could look at who worked where with whom, and then over time see what the outcomes were for the company. Oh, wow, when, when sales and marketing actually started meeting more, and we could see the data because we have it all, wow, the stock price went up, or the level number of patents issued went up, or the product release cycle dropped. They can, you can go back and mine the big data and look for correlations in terms of workplace and work style and reinforce those things. You, you can't figure those things out in advance. You've got to look at the outcomes and then find the patterns that matter and reinforce them. Are there any companies that are doing that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll put another question right there. Sure. Uh, just for everybody from your different points of view, if you can work anywhere you want, why do you want to come together and work in one place? There's, a, there's an interesting piece of research that and I don't remember where this is, so I, I, but I'll try to, not to misquote. Is this your journal? It's not my journal. OK. <laughs> but it could be. Uh, they asked a, a group, somebody asked a whole group of people, uh, where'd you come up with your last biggest idea? And nobody said at work. It was in the shower, it was on vacation, Bike. a bunch of things. What's the first thing you do, though, with your big idea? You go back and share it with other people. So it's an interesting kind of a, uh, I'm not going to, in, in the current working environment, I'm not coming up with my big ideas, but that's the first place I want to go to talk to people and collaborate with that big idea once I get it. So I think that's an interesting maybe thing yeah. to think about. Yeah. Well, I think that concept one is what Mark's really building his business around. Um, you know, I think that we have a greater variety of choice today of where we go to work. You know, and the traditional work environment is still one of those. I mean, you know, uh, 
10 by 15 private office still exist. People are going to use it. It might be used a little bit differently, but it's still part of the workplace. But now I think you've got a greater variety of different types of choices that you can go to work in if you want to rent a $12,000 yacht. Uh, you know, that's a, another option in the mix. So. We have two thousand. We have two thousand offices across six hundred cities. I mean, we have thirty-two people, <laughs> but but we've for three years we lived in liquid space. Uh, but then five months ago, we actually took out an office in San Francisco because we observed that we had an increasing density of employees here, and they continued to aggregate at co-working spaces around the city, and they were choosing those times where they wanted to unpack and share. And it became appropriate and valuable for us to take out an office so that that could be even more reinforced. We still have a work wherever you want to policy. Sure. You still come in whenever you want to, but it got to the point where it made sense for us to have that consolidated space plus all of the all of the mobility as well. And, and what are the what are the sorry to follow up on the what are the advantages you're finding of having that that you didn't have without it? Um, a higher frequency of sharing. Um, I, I would agree very much with that observation that a lot of the invention happens with some solitary focus, and. And only having shared space can be actually distracting. And I think those studies are starting to surface as well. But the level of exchange on the important ideas has, has increased. I've, I've observed it over the last six months. Good. Well, it is late. Um, I appreciate all of you for sticking around. And, uh, first of all, for showing up. Um, I would like to thank our panelists, Corey, Eric, Antonio, and Mark. You guys did a great job tonight. Thank you. And, uh, CPR, FME, uh, Sloan, um, Habitat, Horticulture, um, Mission Bell. Decker Electric, and uh, Mission Bell. So thank you very much. Um, uh, the bar is open. I think there's still some food left out there, so please feel free to stick around. So. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.